Okay, so let's let's start. Welcome everyone to the session of the Patient Engagement uh, Open Forum. My name is Jan Geisler. I'm a, a patient advocate, a cancer patient, one of the co-founders of PFMD, the former director of EU Party, and a contributor to Paradigm, which probably summarizes who actually um, runs the Patient Engagement Open Forum. I'm really, really happy to welcome you to this session. Um, about um, uh, from diagnosis to treatment and beyond personalized medicine. Really happy to have you all on board. We're going to have a very exciting afternoon to discuss about patient engagement in personalized medicine. Um, the Patient Engagement Open Forum is a series of virtual events. We all would have wished to meet in Brussels face to face to have all the discussions about the Open Forum, but we need to do it that way. And that's why it's a very exciting series of sessions on today, September 24th. Uh, we have a couple of parallel sessions and I'm very happy to see that you have decided for this one. Uh, you can see the overview here. It's a series of different, different events. Uh, 10 sessions have been held until now. Three parallel sessions uh, are held today and a couple of more dates are coming up um, until end of November. I want to just say that the session is being recorded because we're going to provide a recording of the of the session um, and it will be published on the open forum uh, patient engagement open forum website that you can actually listen in later on recap the discussions of course tell other people about it so what are we going to do today um, we're, we have a couple of objectives on one hand we want to tell, of course, a bit about uh, personalized medicine and different perspectives on that. But it's not just us telling you what we think. We really want to get your thoughts about the information support needs on personalized medicine, mainly from the patient community, because there is a team behind an activity um, from testing target treatment, uh, targeted treatments. And actually, we want your input. So one of the objectives is really to co-create that, and this workshop today really gives us an insight. Just looking at the agenda of today, um, uh, we are going to first introduce what the From Testing to Targeted Treatments FT3 program is. Uh, we will then step into the current landscape of personalized medicine, and then we're going to discuss with you um, and try to collect your input on support and information needs of patients and healthcare professionals before we go into closing remarks, which me as a moderator, I'll try to chase everyone a bit because we of course want to make sure that uh, we end the session in time while we get all your precious input on that. So that's the agenda for today. I want to just briefly introduce the speakers uh, today. I am just uh, going to moderate this session. I'm going to help on the interactive bits of that. We have Stefan Geisels with us, Executive Dir uh, Director of Digestive Cancers Europe. We have Helena Harnik as Program Director of the Synergist and uh, the responsible person for the testing to treatments program. And Nicole Vicky as the program managers, uh, pro program manager also for the FD3 program. So those are the people plus a couple of more people from the Synergist who are supporting us in running this session. Uh, but just before we go into content, some practicalities um, of, of today's session. It's very difficult to hold these virtual meetings um, by giving people the possibility to, uh, to use their microphone because you can't see people, you can't hear people breathing in. And as a moderator, it's much more difficult to give people the voice. That's why you will be muted throughout the webinar, but we have the Q&A button, which you can find, can find on the bottom of your screen for Zoom. Um, and you can actually raise questions there. So whatever kind of question or comment you have, post it in there and the team that includes me and the other speakers and the team uh, in the background, we can either give you give your response now or we can cover it later on in the discussions or we can provide also uh, written feedback on your questions later on because we can download all the questions and can refer to them at a, at a later, later time point. So use the Q&A button on the very uh, bottom and, and try to punch in your things as you, the questions come along uh, while the speakers are presenting um, their different perspectives. Um, as said, the webinar will be recorded and will be made available on the Patient Engagement Open Forum website, so you can recap uh, what, what we do. 
because we do not have a big wall we can stick where we can stick these yellow stickers to the walls um we have um a tool which we are using which is called group map we're going to use that to get your input and also to facilitate discussions and see what are the most important points because we're not only collecting your input we're also giving you a vote at the end to say this is this is really one of the most important factors that's why we're using a tool um, that's why we highly recommend to follow us by computer not on a mobile phone you can see what's going on but on a mobile phone you can't punch in your ideas so easily so i would really recommend if you're not already here with your computer that you probably try to connect the computer um, at least for the last uh, last hour of the meeting that you can actually um, uh, type in your ideas and also help us vote for the most important things that you feel uh, are important um, we're going to provide the link in the chat window, which you can find also at the bottom of the screen next to um, question and answer. So we're going to provide a link on which you need to click. And one of the technical challenges you're going to have in this meeting is having Zoom, this video conference on one, uh, one window, and the browser with the interactive things in your other window. All you need to do is actually click on the group map link and enter your email address. Uh, because you will also get an email to that email uh, address with a link that if you drop out, if your computer battery fails, whatever happens, that's the way you get uh, back onto the group map as well. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, so first of all, I see that we have in total 63 participants plus the panelists in this meeting. And of course, we want to know um, who you are and what you do and from which stakeholder group you're from. So your first exercise is actually that now you're going to get a link in the chat window. Um, I hope you can all find that. Um, just click on chat on the bottom and there's a link which is called join.groupmap.com slash and then the number you can see on screen. And if you click on that, you will actually see um, the, um, the group map in your browser. And please, um, answer, you've got now got three minutes, please answer to that, um, to those questions, because we want to know what kind of stakeholder groups you come from, how many people are from academia, from patient organizations, from, uh, from pharm pharmaceutical industry, policymakers, and so on. You see all the categories there. We want to know what's the main geographic scope of your work. So the main thing that you do, of course, you might do things local and European, but what's the main thing that you do in your pharma or advocacy or academic work? And also which kind of disease areas you mostly are mostly relevant to your work. You might be a, on multiple, but you might have a focus. That's what we want to know. I'm going to give you two and a half minutes to answer that survey now. And in case you have issues, just drop them in the question and answer section. And we're going to monitor that and also respond to that if there's an issue. So one more minute. Thirty seconds.
10 seconds. Okay, we're done. Thank you so much. And now looking at the results, you should be able to see the results now. Um, you can see that about 40% um, are patient representatives, patient advocates or patient organization representatives, uh, plus 10% patients. So 50% are actually from the patient community, about one fourth of people uh, from the pharmaceutical or biotech industry. Uh, we have a couple of consultants with 6%, um, we have 5% diagnostics in medtech industry and 3% uh, of people are coming from academia. So it's a very good mix of different, uh, different stakeholders, but I'm of course very delighted that we have so many patient and patient advocates with us, especially. Uh, the main geographic scope of people, about 52% have a global scope. Um, so really not just Europe, but global. And about 10% are mainly focused on the local level, another 16% on national. And um, what disease areas, that's a, that's a very strong mix um, from all the different uh, disease areas, which is really nice. And apologies to those that are uh, not from cancer. We're using cancer as an example in this session about personalized medicine. But the things that we do in the area of testing is very well transferable to many other rare diseases, common diseases, uh, which are outside of oncology. So we feel it's very, going to be very relevant for you, um, whatever disease area you're coming from. Um, very good to see that. So I'd ask you now actually to uh, switch back to Zoom. So don't close the browser window because you're going to need the group map later on. If you have closed it already, we're of course uh, sharing the link again at the later stage. But we're going now going back to presentations and uh, so that's why I please switch back to the Zoom window. So what we're doing next uh, is actually introducing our first speaker. So, uh, speaker I'm really delighted uh, to have Stefan Geisels with us. He's Executive Director of Digestive Cancers Europe. He's a cancer survivor. He's co-chair of the European Cancer Organization's Patient Advocacy Workgroup. Um, uh, advocacy committee, and he's doing a lot in We Can, the work group of European Cancer Patient Organizations, and many other things. So he's a very well-established um, and very active patient advocate, and he's going actually to talk about from testing to targeted treatments program. So Stefan, floor, floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jan, for the nice words and, uh, and introduction. Um, we will speak for another uh, few minutes about testing to target the treatment program. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, what we have seen in, in uh, the last decades in research and, and scientific developments in, uh, from a medical perspective is, is quite amazing. So in the past, everything in the traditional environment, we're talking about uh, simple, well, simple is maybe not the right word, but procedures like chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Uh, relatively uh, simple interventions that were applied to everybody with the same condition. Uh, what we are moving now into is something completely different. It's a much more segmented approach where all the different aspects of the patient's uh, cause and the science behind it becomes more apparent. Uh, so we're looking at sub-tissue and metastasis in, in breast, bone, uh, skin. We have all the resurgence of proteomics, metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics, and pharmacogenomics. We've seen the arrival of uh, targeted treatments, you know, the immunotherapy, cancer vaccines, uh, CAR cell, CAR T cell therapy, uh, tumor modeling and testing. Uh, so all this is based on new scientific insights in our, uh, the workings of our genomics. And we looked at all the, the genetic mutations that are responsible for cancer, like BRCA, HER2, EGFF, and many, many others. And then, of course, the personal factors like age, sex, uh, ethnicity, etc. So where in the past, it was a kind of a one-size-fits-all approach for all patients with the same condition. Today, we have multiple treatments that are available depending on the, the very specific uh, context of the individual patient, uh, the patient's individual genetic makeup, but also the type of cause that uh, resulted in, in cancer. 
and I apologize to the other patient in other communities, but of course I know cancer much better than, uh, than other diseases. Thank you, next slide. And so that is what we are trying to, to cover now. So in the end, the ultimate goal of all this is to make sure that we have uh, individual and, and tumor profiling, allowing us to have better risk assessment, better treatment uh, decisions, um, being able to have prognostic factors of you know, what is the, the lifetime expect, expectation is for that individual patient with that specific uh, um, diagnosis. Uh, and also, and I think very important, is uh, predicting response to treatment. Which type of genetic makeup, both of the individual, you know, the immune response, but also the tumor itself, what are the actual causes? What is the remedy going to be? to make sure that uh, the patient can be cured. And then of course also predicting adverse events. So what in the past was like a blind approach to treating the patient and hoping for the best, what we will see in the future is that it will be much more specific, uh, much more targeted, much more effective, and as a result also uh, a lot more efficient. And next slide. So, what we've seen in the past, and uh, for those active in cancer, we've seen 170 new drugs um, approved in the last 20 years, and the number is, is uh, significantly increasing. We have twice as much in the last few years as we had in the, in the first uh, 10 years. And we see the same with the, the science and how it's moving forward. So this is a, a very nice visual coming from an, a Nature article of last year. So you can see that in, in uh, cancer, so the targets that our uh, research is being conducted on has doubled uh, between 2017 and 2019. And so you, you can see that today there's probably more than 500 targets uh, in the pipeline for drug discovery. And I think these are amazing facts and I think it's uh, very nicely presented and it shows the complexity of our body, the complexity of disease and uh, the, the, the surgical precision with which new development, new drugs are being developed, new treatments are being developed to be able to have a personalized approach to, in the, to the individual patient. So this is a fascinating evolution and we hope that it will bring a lot of new uh, treatments to the market in the coming years. And then as an example, because I think it's very important in all this to to listen to the patient. And uh, we will now listen to uh, the testimonial of Leslie Manot. She's a lung cancer uh, patient from France. And uh, she's somebody who's a, a wonderful case of how personalized medicine can help individual patients. Um, Leslie, the word is you, the floor is yours. Bienvenue, soyez la bienvenue, et on vous attend avec. Uh, Beaucoup d'attention. Merci Stéphane for the introduction and I'm really very honored by the invitation from FT3 and the Sanagist. I was diagnosed in 2016 after several generalist consultations. Like a lot of lung cancer patients, I didn't have, I didn't have uh, significant symptoms, only a cough which did not recover since four months despite different treatments, and I was a little bit tired. I was young, as only 45, mother of a four years boy, non-smoker, non-professional exposure, no worries. So I wait some weeks before undergoing chest radiography. The radiologist was very strange when he came back to me. He said that he saw six centimeters spot and that I had to obtain a consultation for a CT scan rapidly. It was August, so big holidays in France, and I was alone to go to the local hospital for the CT exam. The other radiologist took only one minute to ask me if I was a smoker, to tell me that this type of cancer can have a treatment and that I have to find a pneumologist urgently. I was really shocked. So I asked advices to my friends to find the best university hospital in Paris to treat a lung cancer. 
and I get a consultation 10 days later. I spend two days for all the specific exams like PET scan, cerebral MRI, pulmonary function testing, electrocardiogram, blood exams, bronchial thromboscopy, and lung biopsy. But I have to wait 10 days more before the molecular testing result. The consultation for the announcement was not a big surprise, as I was already pretty sure of the diagnosis. I knew the prognosis of lung cancer because I was working on oncology drugs before, and I was sure to die very soon. I was almost happy as I did not have any metastasis. Only two lymph nodes were involved, but surgery was not possible at this stage. Mutation analysis shown that a worse one translocation was responsible for the growth of my tumor. The worst one mutation is rare, affecting less than 1% of all people with lung cancer. I was very lucky because four years ago, not all the French hospitals tested this mutation. And there is not a lot of drug against the worst one because there are not enough worst one patients worldwide to be profitable for pharmaceutical research. A few targeted treatments developed for other translocation were available for was one patient. Hopefully, as I was in a major treatment center, I had access to a new drug. This was a targeted therapy, not yet marketed in Europe, but with an early access program in France. Only two pills per day and light digestive disorders as adverse events. Hospital checkup every three months. I was very surprised and I found that it was really easy to be a cancer patient nowadays and it was effective on the tumor. Medical team decided to intensify the treatment in order to cure the disease by surgery when it would be possible. I started concomitant radiotherapy, chemotherapy during six weeks and experienced the real life of cancer patients. Due to a radio-induced esophagus, I lost eight kilograms and did not leave my bed during one month. As there were no data on concomitant radiotherapy, chemotherapy with targeted therapies, administration, I had to stop my miracle drug. Two months after, the efficacy assessment showed metastasis on my brain and liver. They were very small, but they were here and I became afraid to have scissors in the front of my child. I came back to my previous targeted therapy, but I have to stop for inefficacy after eight months. The next one gave me leader, liver disorders, and I had to decrease the dose and then to stop for inefficacy after two months. Physicians considered the irradiation of my brain metastasis, but I was very afraid. So I start another miracle pill, which has the capacity to treat also the brain metastasis. One more time, it's because I was in a big university Parisian center that I could have access to this new drug. It was not yet marketed in France for was one patient, but authorized for temporary use by French health authorities. And since 30 months now, I'm taking one pill per day see radiologist and my favorite pneumologist every three months, but there is, there is a price to pay. I have lipid disorders and I took 20 kilograms, but I have almost a normal life. This cancer announcement was like a tsunami in my life. During one year, I was not able to read any article on lung cancer because I was so afraid about the percentage of deaths. I was just looking for patients like me to share my feelings. I mean, injustice. And when most of lung cancer patients felt guilty because of previous tobacco abuse. That's why I look for patient associations. Even with my previous professional life, I was lost to, lost to understand the different terms. Mutation, fusion, translocation. Nobody explained this to me. 
I'm feeling always very lucky to have access to targeted therapies so early after the diagnosis. But as it was on an early, early stage of development, there were no notice for patients for worse one. And as, as it was an early stage of, uh, in this center, we had also the possibility to have pharmaceutical consultation. A pharmacist discussed with you about the dual side effects, prevention, and so on. To conclude, I will not be alive today without molecular testing and targeted therapies. All the patients should have this chance. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Leslie. Well, very interesting case, and, and we wish you a lot of courage with the, the further treatment. Thank you. But, uh, and we're very happy that you're with us today. I think uh, survival is always one of the critical things that we patients want but also good quality of life is, is critical. So many thanks for your uh, courageous testimonial. And I can also see that you are part of Mon Réseau Cancer du Poumon in France. Uh, we've also just recently launched uh, Mon, Can Mon Réseau Cancer Colorectal. Also yes. part of uh, Passion Réseau. So good le, le, Yes. Tonight. Last baby of the story. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you to you. So I think that the, the story of Leslie uh, really demonstrates the importance of uh, what we are intending to do with uh, FT3, uh, making sure that uh, targeted medicines are accessible, reality for patients who can benefit from it. And uh, I think, as, uh, as Leslie pointed out, I think it's important, first of all, for patients to understand what it's all about. You know, what, what do we mean by, you know, a genetic mutation? What does this fusion mean? What does uh, this translocation, as you mentioned, so we have to be aware of the potential treatments. We're not going to replace doctors, but I think it's critical that we, we know the, the language and understand the treatment options. Uh, the second is that, uh, and I think that's part of the work that we are going to do, is to build a value case through responsible data sharing. You know, both uh, from a principal perspective, but also in practice. You know, what, what does it mean to have targeted uh, therapies? What, have, what does it mean to have personalized medicine? Uh, what is the impact of efficacy going to be on, on real-world effectiveness and uh, efficiency of the healthcare system? Um, what are the health economic aspects related to that? And what is the quality of life that can be identified? And then the third pillar of activity uh, will be to identify systemic barriers and, and opportunities. I think it's very important to understand where uh, the treatments can be provided. I think it's also in under important to understand whether, for instance, shared decision-making models are in place in the, in the treatment center so that patients can really uh, listen and engage with uh, the, the, the treatment team with the right knowledge available in terms of patient expectations, but also in terms of technology available. I think it also has to do with the availability of molecular tests. Uh, as we've heard from, from Leslie, that's not the case in every center. So what can we do to make that happen? So we have worked with uh, the, the program so far. I mean, this is just a, a picture of the people who have uh, worked uh, very hard over the past year uh, to develop the program. So they're all, as you can see, they're, they're all very smart, but uh, they're all very knowledgeable on top of that. And uh, we've engaged with them. Uh, I will not present them, but you may uh, meet them in the, in the near future. So based on these three pillars, we have set up a program for the coming uh, project. If we can have the next slide. So we've set up working groups. Uh, and so the first working group will work uh, on patient and uh, health care professional education and awareness. The second working group on data and evidence and the third one on systemic barriers and opportunity based on the three pillars. Uh, you will you see on the slide, and I will not go through every detail of it, but all the deliverables that are being planned at the moment. Uh, from toolkits, uh, standards, uh, landscaping, call to actions, white papers, and things like that. So join us. I mean, if you are a patient or a patient organization or in a pharmaceutical company or any of the other partners, also, unfortunately, no regulators and policymakers today, but I mean, they're all welcome to join. Uh, the organization itself is open to anybody. Uh, we have some very strict governance standards that the majority of the, the, the the, the board are patient organizations, but uh, the 
objective is to be multi-stakeholder so that the perspectives and the insights of all the different partners can be integrated uh, to the benefit of everyone. So afterwards, at the end of this of the, the presentation, you will have contact details of uh, the synergies to coordinate the program and who run the organization and the secretariat. So you can contact them if you're interested to join. It's an open call at the moment. And I think this was my last slide. Yes, and I give the floor now to, to Helena. Thank you, Stefan. So um, I'm the executive director of the Thumb Testing to Targeted Treatments Program. I'm very happy to be with, here, with, with you today. Um, as Stefan was explaining in the introduction, one of the key priorities of the FT3 program is to unify, synergize, and accelerate activities in precision medicine. We are discovering, and you will soon see, that the precision medicine landscape is very complex, fragmented, and fast-changing. And we believe that in this context, collaboration is key. Collaboration is key to building a strong value case for precision medicine, and also to um, identify uh, and accelerate best practices and to make them sustainable. So having said that, the members decided that one of the first activities would be to begin to map this complex landscape. And that means identifying all the different initiatives, organizations, experts, and resources in precision medicine. And we would be doing that not only to inform our own first deliverables, but also to be able to share that back with the precision medicine community and with the patient community. And we would like to make that available also through an interactive and dynamic platform that we are calling for now Precision Medicine Synapse. And we are hoping to launch this interactive platform by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Those of you who are familiar with the patient engagement synapse will know how impactful this platform can be. The idea today is to show you just a snapshot of the first research we have done. I want to emphasize that we have not done an exhaustive research yet. The success of our research is really dependent on the amount um, and quality of the research that we're able to collect, and we really rely on your support to be successful in this regard. In terms of the methodology of the research we have done so far, we have started with information that has been shared to us by partners. Um, this might be resources or interesting publications that they have reading, presentations, and so on. And we have combined that with some of our own online research of publicly available information. We have mainly been searching in English, although sometimes we have complemented that with some other languages where we have some additional language capabilities on our team. In terms of geographic scope, we have focused, uh, we have not focused on any particular geography, um, uh, but there is naturally a limitation or, or constraint imposed by the language that we're searching in. And we hope that with your support again, that we can expand um, the scope. Next slide, please. So the precision medicine ecosystem is, is very extensive. We have been looking at many different aspects of it. We've been looking at different types of stakeholders and activities within uh, precision medicine, anywhere from patient organizations to diagnostics and pharmaceutical companies to identifying what are the different initiatives and projects out there, what are some leading experimental medical centers, hospitals, and so on. And for each of these, not just identify who they are, but also understanding what is it that they're doing and their focus areas and the people behind it and the outputs that they are creating. And really trying to make a sense of this and comparing and con contrasting them to identify potential synergies and maybe some gaps where no one is working where we really need to pay some attention. Next slide, please. So if we uh, take a look at multidisciplinary in initiatives as an example, So here is just an example of the kind of um, further research that we would like to do. If we take a look at the multidisciplinary initiatives and look at their primary focus, so we have really simplified this and of course that in reality their activities are much more complex, but we are looking here at three different areas of activity, education and awareness, data and research, and policy. And we can begin to try to identify which each of these uh, projects and initiatives fit and start to compare and contrast them. We have, for example, the International Consortium for Personalized Medicine, which you can see at the bottom. You can see that it's between data and research and policy, as research is its main activity, um, but they also do some policy. It's an organization that was established with and working with the European Union. 
Its members are research and policy organizations and ministries of health, and its geographic scope, of course, is Europe. In contrast, you can see a little bit to the right is the International Cancer Genome Consortium. This is, it's an international consortium and it's firmly focused on data and research. This is a consortium that's solving challenges to make global genomic data sharing for cancer possible, providing the international community with comprehensive genomic data for many cancer types. So again, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of research that we can do to try to understand the precision medicine landscape and importantly, to understand opportunities for potential collaboration. Next slide, please. So perhaps what is more immediately relevant to the discussion we're going to be having today, we have also been looking at what resources already exist when it comes to precision medicine and looking first at patient resources and also resources for healthcare professionals, which I will come to the next slide. Um, here, we were looking at two different factors, the geographic scope, which is where that patient resource can be used and not where the patient resource has been created, um, against all the different kinds of information that patient resource provides to try to understand what is out there and again, where are there um, potentials for collaboration and maybe where there are potential gaps. So you can already see at a glance that there are many resources that we have found that are providing basic information about precision medicine. So in this aspect, it seems quite strong. Another aspect that seems to be quite available in terms of information is information on genetic testing. However, based on the resources that we have looked at so far, it seems that there are fewer resources available providing practical support when it comes to precision medicine. Practical support such as how to prepare for an appointment with your healthcare professional or how to overcome access barriers. What happens, for example, when you identify uh, a mutation where there is a targeted treatment available, but it's not available for you because of reimbursement reasons and so on. On the right, we also have three examples of the resources that we have identified, and they're from three different types of stakeholders or organizations. The first one is from a diagnostics company called Blueprint Genetics. The second one is from a British cancer charity, and the third one is from a patient organization, Longevity, which is also one of the patient organizations that we currently work with. Next slide, please. If you go back one, yes. And then if you look at the healthcare professional resources, we can already see at a glance that there are fewer resources compared to patients. However, what was quite interesting was we discovered that of the resources we looked at, there were some that were very extensive, maybe a bit more extensive than the ones that we had identified for patients. So this is a good sign. We were looking at whether the resources provided guidance on how to interpret data, did they provide clinical decision support tools and whether they were providing general education and support for healthcare professionals. And we have again some examples on the right. Next slide, please. So again, the quality of the potential for the mapping is directly relevant to the, the quality of the resources and information and the quantity of information we're able to gather. And we really rely on your support to be able to do this. And if you can support us, this is also a way that you can help us identify gaps and needs in your country um, and also globally. So we would really appreciate your help to look for information and to identify information about the uh, availability of precision medicine in your country information about any existing initiatives and projects which you might be involved in or may have heard about information about leading hospitals experimental medical centers and so on near where you live key actors in precision medicine in your country but i would like to stress that we would also be interested in understanding what are the up-and-coming people or organizations in precision medicine because again this is a very dynamic and fast moving uh, topic. We're also interested in gathering any kind of research that's ongoing and it could be on any aspect of precision medicine such as the cost effectiveness. We're also interested in identifying the different organizations that are involved and so we see that there are many patient organizations joining the call today. So if you have existing activities or are simply interested in the topic, please let us know and we would be happy to connect with you. And of course, resources for patients and healthcare professionals or indeed any other stakeholders, which might include toolkits, guides, and videos. Now, we want to hear from you, from what is it that you need with regards to precision medicine, and specifically, what is it that patients need? 
and your input is absolutely critical in addressing these gaps. So with that, I would like to hand over to Jan, who will explain to you about the next interactive activity that we will do together. Thank you so much, Helen. And also thank you, Stefan, and also Leslie for all the different insights. And it probably demonstrates the complexity and at the same time, the need um, for information around personalized medicine. I've been monitoring the Q&A that was coming and the questions um, that came in. And of course, there's the question, so how does this relate to us? Um, this is oncology, we're in rare diseases, or we're in this or that. How does that relate? And Helena has also demonstrated all the different initiatives that are out there on personalized medicine and also the lack of resources when it gets a bit more complex because on one hand, we have general methodology around uh, personalized medicine. And on the other hand, we then have, um, let's say, a lot of basic resources that are general but not applicable to my disease. So that's, those are some of the things that we want to look at. And what we actually want to do on one hand is collect all these resources that you know about, that Helena has actually outlined. And you find in the chat an email address and you also found it on the slides where you can send things to this initiative because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to base it on that. But now, we're moving into the interactive part of this meeting uh, because we want to learn from you. So what are the needs? And I know every one of you has a different background. Half of us here are patient advocates. Half of us are from other stakeholders. Everybody is in a different disease area. Everybody has a, probably a different insight. Everybody has a different need in terms of what I need to know about personalized medicine. And that's why we want to actually pick your brains now in the next phase um, of the discussions. And what we've tried to do if we think about personalized medicine is to try to map out the patient journey. And I don't particularly like the word of patient journey because usually what we experience as patients is everything else than a, than a joyful journey. It's something that we all feel and where everyone is different. But of course, we need to think about different phases um, that might be different from disease to disease, from person to person, but in the end, it's a flow of things where you think about the risk when you actually um, think about probably getting uh, a specific disease or condition. Will I get it? What's the risk of developing it? Or maybe you even have a, a genetic risk factor in your family that might made, make you more susceptible to risk of a specific disease, but you don't know whether it's going to hit you or not. Um, then we talk about the area of diagnosis, where you're trying to find out you've had symptoms, you have experience with things that you cannot explain, you've been going from doctor to doctor, actually find out, and in the end is trying to get that kind of confirmation, do I have a specific disease, or does that really relate to me, how does that work, why do I experience what I experience, um, what kind of tests do I need to do? Uh, to have an accurate diagnosis. And for some diseases, common diseases, it's sometimes quite easy. For others, it's a terrible journey for patients to actually find out until they actually get a confirmation what they've been experiencing, but nobody could really say what it is. And then, of course, in this new area of personalized medicine, target therapies, and so on, is, is of course, the question, am I a candidate for biomolecular profiling or biomarker testing? I myself, I'm a, I'm a cancer patient. I've experienced, uh, let's say, a specific genetic aberration that actually made my diagnosis. And Leslie has also talked about a specific subtype of her disease um, that actually was very decisive on what happened afterwards in terms of therapy. So that whole bucket of diagnosis is very important. And we know there are huge informational needs of patients and also of healthcare professionals to give a correct diagnosis to actually try to understand what's actually going to happen next. Then, of course, the whole bucket of prognosis, should I treat this disease or should I watch and wait? In some diseases, you have the option and others you don't. Uh, what are the results of my testing? So what do, how do the results that I get from a test actually translate into uh, what I should actually decide together with my physician? Um, 
are there targeted therapies that can be used? Is there anything that specifically addresses that kind of subtype, that specific form and shape of the disease that I experience? And do all the test results lead to actionable treatment options? Because we know with genetics, we can have a lot of information, but how does that information, let's say, translate into something that really leads to action on a medical or clinical sense or in behavior, behavioral change or whatever? So prognosis is the third bucket, which is really important. Then moving next to treatment, of course, you have the question, how should I treat this condition? What should I do about it? What are the different options? What treatment is best for me? Is it experimental therapy? Is it standard therapy? Is it a combination of multiple disciplines? Are there any suitable clinical trials? So what do I, what do, I do about this whole bucket of treatment? And I mean, this gets tremendously complex. If you look at the diseases that I've been involved in in oncology, there was years ago, there was like lung cancer or chronic myeloid leukemia or breast cancer or whatever, and they split up into more and more subtypes. Um, so it gets personalized medicine might also mean that you're more alone because you know nobody else who's actually getting the right, uh, the, the same regimen. So the whole bucket of treatment is a very interesting and complex issue for patients to understand in the area of personalized medicine. And then of course, monitoring, follow-up. Is the treatment working? Is it doing what it does? What other things of my body is actually affected and so on? Should my treatment be continued? Should I change pathways? Should I change horses? Uh, because it's probably not working as intended. Should I stop treatment? Um, am I in the position either in remission or because of progression that I should not continue the way I have at the moment? And all these kind of follow-up questions. Are other treatments needed? If we look at the very personalized data that you have about yourself, plus the data out there on personalized treatment, uh, should I do something else? What are my options for second or third line and so on? And are there better tests to monitor remission and to understand what is residual disease or what is happening? So the whole monitoring bucket is of course important. And even though, I mean, this looks linear and for no patient, it's actually linear like that, it's always, crossroads and changing direction and so on. We actually want to find out from you is what do, we, what do we do about this? How do we inform patients about this? What are the informational needs? And coming back to the, the presentation that Helena had is there's a lot of basic information around, but what are the real informational needs? And this is what we're going to cover now. And now again, we're going back to group map. Uh, so get, go back to your browser where you've been or um, and uh, go into the link that you find in the chat. Uh, because the exercise in the next couple of minutes uh, with you would actually to understand from you what are the issues. And you can actually now see that the screen has changed in, in, in group map. You actually see five different columns. This is the roadmap that I have or this kind of journey that I have outlined from risk uh, over diagnosis, over prognosis, over treatment, and over monitoring. So these are the different things. And what you'll find in the very little text below that, are actually the points that were on screen in Zoom in the, in the presentation from risk, the risk uh, to get a disease over diagnosis of the disease and the tests and whether potentially very targeted tests might be, might be helpful to understanding the prognosis and uh, the, what the tests mean to your direction over treatment. So how should I treat? What are the options? What, what is probably best for me as a person? And then monitoring. So this kind of follow up and retesting, understanding where the journey is going. So you see these different points. And what we actually want from you now is actually that you list your ideas on patient community information and support needs. Um, and I can already see the first ones are coming. And what, you're, what we're actually asking you to do is think about these five different columns. Think about the informational needs of the patient community where you're in touch with, either because you're a patient representative or because you're in touch with patients or either because you have a perspective of what 
the unmet need of patients is in terms of information and support needs on personalized medicine. You can click on the plus symbol and then you get your cursor and you can actually add things. Uh, you can either add new things if they're not there yet, or you can click on an idea that's already there now and you can actually comment or even put a thumbs up, a like on them uh, because you think you agree that this is really an important factor and you would have written the same. Um, you can, of course, also include, so this, is, this focus is really about the patient community information and support needs. But if you think about informational needs of, our, of other stakeholder groups, you can add them, but please add to the text that this is for HCPs or this is for um, so healthcare professionals or is specific for people in the industry or so that, or for caregivers that we actually understand this is probably for different target groups. So I can see you're already busy. So I stopped chatting you up here so you can really work on these. Um, I'll give you um, about 10 minutes for this. Uh, we're good in time. So there is no rush. Take your time. Think about the things. And if you have any comments or questions about how this works, post them to the question and answers in Zoom. And we'll get back to you there. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for being so active. I'm really, really impressed uh, because a lot of people have actually contributed. Uh, we have 83 people on that map, which is really great. And I would say we move to the grouping now. So if you um, can just bring everyone to the grouping stage. Okay, so you can see that we've been trying to already merge a couple of things and probably what we, what we can do now, because in the end, what the result of that map will be, um, we can of course share the whole map with you and the team will um, uh, look at all the different factors after this meeting to make sure nothing is lost. But at the same time, of course, we want to know which ones are most important and should be taken care of with specific attention in terms of patients' unmet needs. And so I'm now going through uh, column by column to look at the couple of the, the group factors here. And of course, in terms of risk, one thing, one thing that stood out is how do you cope and live with a known risk? So how do you deal with knowing there's a risk, but they don't know whether it's going to happen? Um, and uh, to what extent uh, you would deal with the emotional burden, especially also when the risk is small, but you know that it might be, might be there. Um, one of the things that actually came up there was also um, who qualifies for that kind of testing and whom do you discuss that with? Um, so there were a couple of contributions on that. Then of course, understanding the, the own risk factors because it doesn't, it doesn't help when you know about risk, but how, you, how do you deal with that kind of probability that things might happen? One of the things that also came up um, is actually future risks for family and uh, children and family members. So how do you deal with risks that your children might have or future children might get? Um, and how do you yourself deal with that? And I'll just try to color mark a bit on, on the different factors that we actually looked at. Um, then one topic that of, of course came about reducing risk. And um, I'm just going through the list here. Also, where do you actually get uh, the interpretation of the different risks? So looking at, the, shall I talk to, a genetic counselor and so on. So there are a couple of factors here um, and many more. Uh, one of the things of course that came up is um, the uh, pandemic and how do we deal with high risk um, to develop cancer in pandemic times when you cannot do surveillance and monitoring and so on. So is there a special risk due to the pandemic and so on. So these topics also came up. And if we move to diagnosis, I mean, if we look at a couple of these groups, um, 
where can I go to get the information? What are reliable sources? What are the best resources for learning about testing, what testing means and how testing is being done and so on. So this was an important factor that, that came up. Um, where does the test and diagnosis happen? So finding about the location where to go was a factor that came up. Um, support in getting a second opinion because we know that it's sometimes quite cumbersome for patients to go to a different clinical center. Also, the, the treating doctor might feel criticized for getting a second opinion. So that's an important point is how to how how actually to help patients getting that kind of information where they should go and also give them the confidence that it's, that it's okay to get that test. Uh, then, of course, the big topic of what kind of tests are needed. Um, so um, what do I test? Um, what kind of tests should I have? Um, then, of course, in case there might be something around clinical trials, finding and applying for clinical trials was a topic. Uh, so can I apply for a clinical trial? Does my di diagnosis actually make me eligible for one? Where can I find clinical trials that are recruiting for patients like me and so on? So that, is, that also has to do with the diagnosis. And then availability of testing, of course, is a big bucket. So is, is what kind of tests are available? Is genomic testing available in my nearby hospital uh, or in my country? Is it available to all patients? Is it available to me uh, and all these issues around availability because you might hear about the test, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that you actually have access to it. So these were a couple of points. Let's see. Then one of the things of course came up uh, was actually uh, no news is not good news. So what if my physician doesn't tell me anything? Does it mean I have not been tested? Does it tell I um, uh, there's been no issue with the results of the test? Or does it mean the test results are not good? So that kind of uncertainty to get test results in the diagnosis. I'm just going more through the list. And then, of course, there's the whole issue around um, uh, economics. So how do I get uh, the test paid if it's not reimbursed? Um, how can actually, um, uh, how do I access it if my healthcare system is not offering them and so on? So the whole economics around that, of course, is also very important. So that's the second bucket of um, diagnosis. If we look at prognosis, um, there's one area of what to expect and potential benefits and risks. So what are the options? What side effects to expect? Are they acceptable? Do the negative effects weigh more than possible benefits of the treatment? What are the benefits and risks of my, in my personal case? So the whole area of benefits and risks in terms of uh, prognosis and what can I expect was something that was very, uh, very often mentioned. Then, of course, how to get a second and third opinion. We covered that in the other one, but that appeared very often here in that section too. Um, then, of course, there's the whole issue around accuracy of tests, where patients actually want to understand how, how accurate they are, are there mistakes? We read a lot at the moment about false positive, false negative, and so on. Uh, so that was a topic. Then how are tests communicated and by which, uh, which clinician? Because we know um, having a test result is one thing, but understanding it is a different story. Um, then a very important topic also for patient advocacy is how can I as a patient access other patients or relatives to talk to them about the experience with treatment? Um, so how do I actually understand that? And four people actually gave four thumbs up for this, for this topic. So it seems to be very important. How do I, especially in the area of personalized medicine, find other patients with a similar issues? Um, 
then of course, in terms of prognosis, when you know how the, what the prognosis is, will there be psychological support, mental health support, um, or need patients find, find it themselves? And um, then there's one issue about timing. So how soon after testing are results given and time allowed for treatment decisions? So the whole issue about timelines, which I think is very important um, because then decisions of, often need to be made in a very rapid way. Then, of course, can I have this target treatment for my, for my situation, for my condition? So even if there's a prognosis, can I access therapies? And let me see, and I'm, you probably see that on the group map, I'm color marking some of the, these points as I, as I talk you through them, just to highlight some of them which, we, which we've seen. Uh, how to discuss test results and treatment decisions with my doctor. That's again about communication. So how do you deal with that? So that's the prognosis bucket. There are a couple more which you can find on screen. If we move to treatment, uh, so informational needs around treatment, uh, we of course have this whole issue around benefit of one treatment against current treatment or standard therapy and so on. So how to highlight that? So how does that personalized medicine compare to other things that are being offered to me? Then, Peer and family support was mentioned by in three posts. Um, so um, availability, availability of family member or friend to discuss options, peer support, and so on. So I'm just highlighting that. Then there's one, one thing about how can I assure that the treatment decision is based on best available evidence. So how can I make sure that what is suggested to me in personalized treatment is really evidence-based and there, there are justifications why actually that should be used. Then let's see, of course, the whole area of questions about cost and reimbursement, what are the expenses, what sources of funding are available to me, if target treatment is not available, is it in general affordable? Um, is it covered? Um, then the whole issue around how to find out about clinical trials came up. So how can I, if we talk about personalized treatment, how can I find trials, clinical trials that might offer them or might actually test them? Okay. What else do we have? What are the side effects of treatment is a very often mentioned concern of patients. Of course, they need to understand, and especially in personalized medicine, it's more difficult to find another patient with the same regimen and probably experiencing the same thing. So that came up. Um, what in case of comorbidities? So how, what role do they play in therapy choice? Okay. There's a lot about access in that column and you can probably scroll through the different options here as well. Of course, the whole issue around uh, the treatment impact on quality of life which also has to do with side effects, but it might affect uh, other areas of life as well. And then of course, the, if we just look up on one point that received a lot, lot of thumbs up as well, if I chose one treatment, will the other treatments still be available to me later on? So does choosing one actually build bridges or build walls against other options that I might have in the future. So those are about treatment options. And the last one, oops. And the last one, monitoring. Let's look at those. So what came up there, 
how will monitoring actually involve digital tools and technology? Then how to give the patient community access to their own data and allow them to do analytics. So how can the individual data that is being gathered actually also be accessed by the community to learn from it? Um, will I still be eligible for clinical trials um, after taking targeted treatment? So do I still fulfill eligibility criteria? What else do we have? And of course, the whole issue about how long should monitoring be until the risk of recurrence is back to normal, but also the issue around uh, on personalized treatments, how long do we really need to monitor patients because we probably don't have much evidence around that. Then, of course, the issue around do I need to travel to the different sites, to trial sites, or also to the clinic centers when patients are too Ill or unable? How do you do that in the personalized medicine setting? And, of course, then the whole issue about the chance of recurrence. So I'm highlighting just, just some. I mean, I'm really impressed by all the different things that you have mentioned, and we can, of course, not go through all of them, but you probably also had the time to read through the different um, factors that we had here. One thing that I actually, or we actually want to, um, want to give you now is actually to decide on some of the things that you find most pressing. I mean, you've probably read through a couple of these factors and I don't want to bias your, your, your judgment uh, on the things that I have marked in red. Um, I've just highlighted them to, while I was reading through. But what we are giving you now is actually some um, opportunity to again go through all the different factors and actually provide some votes. And you can actually see that the screen on group map has now changed. Um, and you see this small gray bubble next to uh, each of the factors. So what you actually now have is each of you has five votes. It's actually the same like in a physical wall in a room. Just imagine all these things would be on a wall, on a yellow, on a post-it note or something like that. We have five of these round, small stickers. You go to the wall and actually stick it to the thing um, that you feel is probably of highest priority in terms of patient unmet need for information and support. So each of you now has five stickers. And you can actually stick them to each of the different points by clicking on the plus symbol. Um, you see there's a gray area next to each point. And if you click on plus, then you actually stick one of these stickers uh, to that point. The good thing against a physical wall is you can take the sticker away without tearing off the whole paper. So you can also change your mind as you read through. So what we actually want to do now, because that will actually inform the team to really um, prioritize those informations that are, would be most helpful to patients and carers is what are the things that you feel is most important to do first. So now you have a couple of minutes again where you can distribute your five votes to any of the factors on the board. Okay, so time's up, which actually means we can go to results. It's so interesting because it's so different to uh, a face-to-face -face workshop. We can see people running around, taking their stickers and so on, and putting them to the wall. Now, when you look at the window, that's, that's the interesting part because you can see on which points um, you all agreed would be probably first priority. And, as I said earlier on, this would not be, or this is not an exclusive list. So we're not saying the things that got most votes is the only thing that the initiative is doing, but it's, it gives us an indication 
on what we should probably focus first, where the real unmade needs are and so on. I'm just going very quickly through that and you're going to get a report, you're going to get a picture of the, of the, uh, of the group map afterwards so you can digest uh, the results, but it really informs the team. So just looking at the left column on risk, I mean, you can see the highest, um, they're now ordered actually by, by number of votes. You can see highest rating on risk was clear explana explanation on the concept of risk and how lifestyle changes can Im impact the risk. Um, or health literature for the whole process from risk to monitoring. So really understand how to communicate um, the whole issue around risk and the whole process actually to patients. That got four votes. Um, clear guidelines for patients for genetic testing, determine risk and how to best ex access that, got three votes. Um, the whole issue around family members, family testing, got in total six votes if we just merge the two. So these are the top top, top rank things in, in risk. If we look at diagnosis, the first one really stand, stand out, which is where can I get the information? So there seems to be huge informational gap in terms of how, how can I, where can I go? What are the best sites to inform me? What are the best resources that actually inform me about getting the right diagnosis, getting testing and so on? And of course, the time points, because we do not want to do tests at a time point where it doesn't make any sense or doesn't really give us direction. So information about what moment or stage of the disease should I get biomarker testing. But then that got f uh, five votes. And then there are a couple of points with four votes. But we can see just by the number of votes, it seems like most people actually put their stickers to the diagnosis column. And probably we're, after this call, we're going to add them up vertically and see but my gut feeling at the moment is the left two columns got most votes overall. Then going to the next column actually on prognosis, how can I access other patients to talk to them about the experience with treatment? So the classical issue around patient organizations, online communities and so on. So how can I find other patients in a similar situation which might get more difficult in personalized medicine just because it fragments more. How, how are the tests communicated and by which clinician? So who is my discussion partner actually to understand test results, understand my prognosis and actually discuss the way forward? And um, so that received five votes, which stands out. And then of course the time period until testing results are provided and the time required actually to, to take a treatment decision got three votes. And uh, does my doctor know the available options for me specifically? Is, is he or she experienced in best using those therapies? So the important point of the expertise of the treating physician and the clinical center. So how much do they know about my condition, about steering me in this personalized medicine world? Going into treatment, highest ranked here by you was actually how will this treatment impact my quality of life? which again, very interesting, shows the typical divergence of the focus on clinical things and the patient priority on quality of life. Then how can I assure the treatment decision is based on best available evidence? So the whole issue around evidence on treatment, where we know that it's very difficult for patients which do not have the medical training to actually understand what is the most up-to-date evidence and how do I understand what it means for me? And then, of course, the whole issue around um, access issues. So availability of treatment, access issues, even if I know there's something, can I get it? And so on. Got four votes. And then there are two with three votes. Benefits of uh, uh, personalized treatment against, for example, current chemotherapy. And also um, understand treatment options and alternatives. So that got a lot of votes, too. And if we just look at monitoring, um, again, highest rating, um, give patient community access to their own data analysis. That's interesting because I, I feel there are a lot of advocates in the room because we are very often see that other people are collecting data, but the patient community can't really do their own conclusions from them. They can't access the data behind that um, and can't use that actually for conclusions on patient services on, for, on the advocacy work that they do and do evidence-based advocacy. Interesting, this got most votes. 
Um, and then, of course, um, uh, patient to be given specific information about how they can be proactive in monitoring the disease and reporting side effects. So how can the empowered patient actually be empowered about their own disease journey, monitoring, reporting mechanisms, and so on? Of course, the duration of monitoring. So how long do I need to be followed up? What is the risk of recurrence? When I'm, am I getting back to normal? What is the grace period after which I can really get uh, back to normal life? Got high number of votes. And then the whole thing about how digital tools and technology being used for follow-up because we know that patients need to queue up sometimes for ages in the clinics. Is there any way to do that more effectively in terms of if you're doing monitoring for years? And then, of course, the whole issue around would I still be eligible for clinical trials after taking a target treatment? So I'm just highlighting some, and it doesn't do justice to all the different um, uh, things that you have contributed, but I hope that gives you some kind of impression that your contributions are not lost. Um, the team will take that up. The team will give you a report about this, um, about the mind map. It will digest all the different things. And if you remember back what Stefan was presenting, uh, the team is really keen to have your support, your knowledge in the working groups of this initiative. And with that, actually, because that's not my role as a moderator, that's the role of the team. I'm going to hand back uh, to, um, to Nicole Vicky to give some closing remarks. And I can just say you've been fantastic. I know it's so difficult in a virtual setting and you feel so silent because you can't hear people discuss and breathe during the meeting. Uh, you've been tremendously effective in contributing such a rich um, set, set of um, uh, information factors for us. Thank you so much for that. Now up to you, Nicole. Great. Thank you, Jan. And thank you, everyone, for your amazing contributions today. Um, it's been actually an overwhelming turnout for this workshop. And um, really, uh, I'm so impressed with the amount of different ideas that we've generated today. Um, Sylvia, if you could put the next slide, please. Thanks. So um, to recap on our objectives for today, so what we set out to do was to really understand information and support needs in the context of personalized medicines with a real focus on patients. And I think everything that Jan has just walked us through and this exercise has really shown that this, was, um, this objective was certainly met today. Um, and then the, the other objective was to utilize this session in order to inform the co-creation of um, personalized medicine support and information materials for the patient community. So for patients, for patient advocates and organizations and the, the community more at large. So our next steps in FT3 will be to um, take on board everything that we've learned today um, and utilize this in the development of different information materials. Um, so we're looking at things like um, adaptable toolkits for patient organizations and um, uh, the mapping that Helena had um, explained earlier of understanding what resources are out there that exist. How can we integrate all of these things together so that we can have a, a really comprehensive um, repository of information to help fill some of these gaps that exist and maybe don't exist. Um, we just don't know where to find things um, necessarily as patients. Um, and above all, um, the insights that we've gathered today will also continue to inform the patient and HCP awareness and education working group and the, the strategy that will guide that work stream in the future. Um, and if any of you are keen to get involved with FT3 or with this working group in particular or any that were presented earlier, then you can feel free to reach out to me. I have my email here, nicole at the synergist.org. Um, and I just want to thank you all once again. This has been a really enriching experience. Um, as my colleagues had presented earlier, I think that the, the space of personalized medicines is really changing the way that we're approaching, um, approaching treatment and particularly in, in oncology. As a, a breast cancer patient myself, I've been on hormone treatment therapy for over seven or nearly seven years now. Um, and so without understanding you know, the, the complexities of my disease, 
and that that wouldn't be an available treatment to me without the testing and, and diagnosis and those availabilities of treatments. Um, so this space is changing rapidly and um, FT3 is certainly going to be putting a lens to that. And um, if you have any questions at all, you can get in touch. And just a note to respond to some of the questions in the, um, in the Q and A that have come through. Several of you have asked about getting um, the um, results that were compiled today in the group map. So we'll take a look on our end and see the best way that we can um, share those and deliver those to you. Um, so we'll be in touch and it, once we have something to share, then we'll do so. Um, the presentation from today and the recording of the webinar will be available on the PE Open Forum website shortly after. And thank you once again for being with us. Have a great afternoon or evening or wherever you are. And I think we can wrap up. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you want to have a quick chat to end? Yes, I'm just copying out the, the chat. Yeah, I'm just checking the last few Q&A that came through. And where did you work before, Leslie? Which company? Um, I started um, with uh, Bo Boeing Gering Lime. Ah, okay. uh, five years. And after it was Cef Cephalon before they were uh, bought by Teva. Mm. After it was Watch during uh, 10 years. It's my uh, long story. And uh, six months 